Welcome to the teaching ministry of Vision Calvary Chapel, where we teach the Bible, the whole Bible, and nothing but the Bible. So join us for today's study to watch, listen, and learn, knowing that the Word of God always works. Undermined his kingship. And David was on the run. He had to leave Jerusalem. And as he was leaving Jerusalem, there was a man named Shimei. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that correctly. But as he was a descendant of Saul, or a, a, of the family of Saul, who David had replaced as king. And as David was leaving with the entourage and, and uh, fleeing Absalom, Shimei was standing on the top of a, of a cliff and he was throwing rocks and dust and cursing David. And one of David's generals said, O king, live forever, shall I go up and cut his head off? That's a great way to get rid of an enemy, especially if someone is badgering you. You hire someone to cut their head off. And David said, no. Perhaps the Lord has put him there to say this. After all, what could be worse than having your son try to kill you? And I share that story with you because it's the very story, as Ryan shared on Tuesday evening, as, the, as each speaker that was opposed to the reservation move thanked the city council for their time, for the honor of being able to speak before them. And when we were finished, one, possibly two, I can't say for certain, but one definitely responded and said how much he appreciated the kindness that we showed in the presentation. So there was a ministry being done even in a protest because it was done the correct way in love. And it was done in truth. However, there was a man that had an ax to grind and he stood up, as Ryan said, and he said, where was the church when this happened? When alcohol licenses were being sold to or provided for Walmart? Where was the church when such and such happened? Where was the church? And he would kind of half turn, and you could tell he was angry. But I was thinking to myself, what struck me was the word of God, that who knows that God didn't send this man to wake you up. So I'm going to share my conviction. It may not be yours, but I want to share with you what God put on my heart as a result of this man. The question was, in my own heart, yes, where is the church? Where was the church? Well, I wanted to say, Lord, we're right here. I mean, we're doing what you want. But that was there at that point. How much have I missed? How much has the salt and light of my life been sequestered because of the things I wanted to do? So this isn't, it's not about me but it is about a conviction that I had that I wanted to share with you. It's a conviction that, uh, you know, often we get warnings. God provides warnings for us. And we are in the last days. There's no question the way life is going. You know, heck, California is burning 109,000 acres just in Northern California alone. Not counting Malibu, not counting, you know, someone would say, well, you know, California deserves it. Well, perhaps we do. But that doesn't negate that there are people that desperately need us. And that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to be talking about salt and light. But before we talk about that, if indeed we have time to get to that, it may be another, another time. But I want to thank you for coming this morning. I want to thank you for bearing with me in my testimony as I share with you my heart. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for the truth of your word. Thank you for sending, I thank you for sending a Shimei to me to stand over me and to, to question, not even directing at me, but directing at us, at your church. Lord, as Keith Green sang, we're asleep in the light. We're asleep in the light. And Lord, I thank you for the awakening. I thank you for the alarm. And I pray, Lord, as I 
as I share with this body, with these wonderful saints, what you've shown me. I pray, Lord, that uh, it would not only prick my heart, but that we would stand for you and make no compromise in our lives. That we are here for you and you only. That's our basis. That's what we're here for. And I thank you for that. I praise you for that. I thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being called by you to be saved by the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. And I thank you for all that are here that have received that. And that we might take that with us and the light that comes with it and shine brightly like a city on a hill that can't be hidden. We thank you, Father, and praise you. Bless my homework, Lord. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, looking at, we're going to be looking at a few things here. And one of the things that struck me was, as believers, quite often we, we forget that we have authority. That we have the right and the privilege, privilege probably more even than a right, but we have the privilege to be able to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that is the call. We were commissioned to that, and uh, it, it's interesting to me that as you study, if you study salt and light, uh, and again, Ryan's going to do an English course. Uh, he taught me quite a bit. I, I, I don't claim to be an English instructor, but I do know that the word the is important. It's called a direct article. And whenever the is used in a sentence, it is singling out a particular item, a particular thing. And I want you to note the number of times in the scripture that the Lord uses the. You are the light. You are the salt. So that excludes, and the first thing I thought, okay, well, how do I explain this? And the Lord kind of said, well, look at the tall boy. Would that not distinguish an individual amongst a lot of boys? Or look at the tall girl. There would be one in particular that's being pointed out. So we are going to talk about the fact that the church, that's you and me, that's Mr. and Mrs. Mann, and the light is there is only one light. Now the light is from Christ. It's not you. You and I aren't the light. Neither was John the Baptist. But we are witnesses of the light, and that light shines through us. We are not the salt, but we are a grain of salt. And that we are used and to be used by God to preserve the, the world, to bring flavor to the world, and to change the world. Those are three properties of salt. And so as we look at that, there are a few things that I thought, well, okay, so what gives, what gives us the right to do this? And if you will open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 28, beginning in verse 19 and 20, Jesus is explaining, Jesus has been resurrected, and he is about to ascend into heaven. And his last words to his disciples, and now that would be you and I, Mr. and Mrs. Disciple, Miss, Ms., Mr. Disciple. Jesus writes, Jesus came to them, speaking of the disciples, and he says to them, all authority has been given to me. Okay, so what is lacking in the authority? Okay, this is group participation. You're supposed to go, nothing. Nothing is lacking of the authority that Jesus was given. He has authority over heaven and earth. And he goes on. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And as a result of that authority, he says to the disciples, who are our great, great, great grandparents, he says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I command you. And lo, don't forget, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So the first thing that we note is, of course, that Jesus has been given all the authority. So he has the right and the privilege to be able to share with you and I. I want to present a case because this is what struck me. God has given me the authority through Christ. 
it's not, it's not as though it's optional, but it's been placed on me the day that I received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. The day I welcomed him into my life and thanked him for the salvation that he provided that I could not do anything on my own. That day, he gave me the authority to be a spokesperson for him, to speak for him, and to shine his light through me. There is not one single thing, including casinos being moved, alcohol being sold, that Jesus doesn't give me the authority to speak in light of his word. He doesn't give me the authority to speak my opinion, but he gives me the authority, he gives you the authority to speak his word because his word is truth. He is the truth. And when we share the truth, when we share the word of God, not what we think and not how we discern what we think, but what it says. Remember David Hawking when he's here? He's used the line numerous times, and I borrow it from him. But he said, the only time I know I'm doing things right and telling the truth is when I'm teaching the Word of God, the Word of God. When I speak God's Word, I know I'm right. And when I speak God's Word, I know that I have the authority that's associated with the Word of God because Jesus says, all authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore. Don't sit around. Don't wait. Ryan said he didn't want to burn us out. And you may have heard it said before, I'd rather be burnt out than rust out. I see in my own life a lot of rust. A lot of rust. And it shames me. And again, I'm not, it, again, I pray as you don't think it's about me. This is the conviction. And you know how God works. You've, you've had it happen. It's like a moment and a twinkling of an eye and all this stuff goes into my head. He's right. Yeah, but he's mad. It doesn't matter if he's mad. Shimei was mad, wasn't he, Bob? Well, yeah, he was. And he was righteously indignant over David, who had taken over for his relative. Not thinking that God put them there. Shimei didn't care. But he was a messenger. There was this messenger that said, you got to look at this stuff, Bob. Where are you? Gently, lovingly, tenderly. The way you reach out to your little one when they're hurt and you grab their hand. When you are, remember when they were so small and you would put your hand out and they could only grab your finger? Especially mine, it looked like a pickle. You know, they had to go with both hands. They grab your finger and you're just amazed. You look down in their little eyes. That's what... That's the way the Lord touches us with things. It's not shame on you. But here, take my hand. And you reach up and grab the finger. Therefore, Jesus said, all authority and power is given to me. Please put that in your mind. Write it down, circle it, highlight it, whatever you have to do. Recognize that all authority was given to God. And what did he do when he received that authority? He said, therefore, as a result of the authority that God gave to me that cannot be abrogated, removed, or changed, nothing can remove that authority that Jesus had. And he said, as a result of what's been given to me, therefore, what is it there for? To tell you and I to go. Therefore, having received the authority from the Father, Jesus gives us a command, and the first command is to go. Which requires, as we said, it requires activity. It requires doing something. It doesn't require sitting and waiting and not doing. Okay, Lord, what do you want me to do? We, uh, following the meeting, we had an opportunity to pray together out in front on the sidewalk, and Becky and I, my wife and I, if you don't know my wife, Becky, we, we were, we don't get the newspaper, and we don't, we basically, not because it's too expensive, but because it's always been, I've always considered, forgive me if you're a member of the Porterville Recorder staff, but I've always considered it the Porterville Distorter. And, and I, I, I say that kind of tongue-in-cheek, 
But I wasn't really interested in my community. Yes, I was interested in what was going on in our state government because I think those guys ought to be in an insane asylum. But that's what I think. But I do have some biblical foundation on that because of the, some of the stuff they do and the, the wild ideas they come up with. And you think, where did that come from? Well, it didn't come from God. So the only other option is it came from the wicked one that's trying to destroy us. And so he commands us to go, which requires action and activity. In James chapter 1, verse 22 through 25, James writes, But prove yourselves to be doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. Notice that? If you hear the word and you're moved by the word and you're excited by the word, but you do nothing about it, then you're deluded, Bob. You're deluded. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in the mirror. So I'm looking in the mirror, thinking, all right, uh, not much I can do about that. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man is blessed in what he does. So there's a promise. It's not left that you got to go do and you don't get something for it. But the promise is a reward, and that reward is something good as a result of doing what God has given you the authority and power and command to do. Therefore, go. Well, where do I go? Well, if you don't have the Porterville recorder and you don't know your neighbors, we have new people that moved in our neighborhood. I'm, I'm ashamed to say, I don't know their name. I'm out in the front yard throwing the ball with my dog and they drive by and, and I kind of wave. We've never been around the corner and they're right on the back fence, right on the other side of the fence. First thing I heard, oh, I shouldn't have said that. Anyway, um, some of the language was different, but I don't believe they're saved. I hope they're not. And so I formulated an opinion right away because they had language problems. I don't like cussing when I'm sitting in my backyard trying to study. And I'm thinking, I had formulated a thousand opinions, but not once did I get off my rear end. I didn't. I was asleep in the light. I did not go around to my neighbor and welcome them to the neighborhood. I didn't say, hi, my name is Bob Ruckman. You may not like me, but <laughs> I'm your neighbor on the fence. I'm the one that keeps throwing back the balls that you shoot over the fence. I like to keep them, but I'm convicted that I shouldn't keep that. And the ones that are chewed up, I can't help that. My dog did that. I didn't do it. But I didn't introduce myself. I didn't say anything. I still haven't done anything, but it's only been a couple days. You know, we're going to have Mike McIntosh come again, and, and I remember him telling a story when he had first begun his, his uh, let's see, Greg is Harvest, what is uh, Horizon Ministries in San Diego. He began Horizon Ministries in San Diego with a McDonald's shooting. It was murder, and somebody went in and shot up a McDonald's in San Diego. And he was not asleep in the light. He thought, what can I do? And so he went and began ministering to the people that had been, that lost loved ones or the people that had been shot. He started doing what God wanted to do and God developed this church now and he was telling us the number of churches that have come from that act of his faithfulness to want to go and do what God had called him to do. Take that command and recognize the authority and go. Ryan is talking about, I need five people that are excited. Are you there? I guess it's got to be me now because I'm convicted. So I guess I'm in it. I'm retired, so I got time. I don't have to grade papers. Thank you, Lord. I don't have to get up every morning at 6 o'clock and be at school at 7. Thank you, Lord. 
I don't have to be up like the farmers at four. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord. I can go to bed at study till midnight and get up at seven. Thank you, Lord. Sorry. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't have said that. God has a plan. And his second thing that he said to them, after the command of go, when they were going, what were they supposed to go and do? Through participation? Make disciples. So go and make disciples of all nations. No one was restricted. No one was held back from becoming a disciple. It wasn't, it didn't, it wasn't based on their wealth or their poverty. It wasn't based on how smart they are, or how clean or how dirty or what they thought. It wasn't based on people that were already saved that are fun to be around. It was based on going and finding people. And we are an offspring of that. Uh, not just the Calvary Chapel, but that's what happened when, when um, Pastor Chuck began teaching and preaching the word is he would preach, he'd find people that would listen. And then those people would go get somebody else. And they would go get somebody else. And what he did was wear a Hawaiian shirt, sit on a stool, and teach God's word. It was that simple. He didn't put down people that liked a particular kind of music. He got past that. He didn't put down people, and some of you, if you've read Calvary Distinctives, it's the kind of heart that we want to have. They had all these new pews. They just got new pews and they were all shiny. And the hippies were coming in with Levi's with the rivets on them. They were scratching the pews. And any of you that have read it, you go, well, you know, that's terrible. You know, we've got to get rid of the scratches. And Chuck said, okay. They had a meeting. He said, okay. Take the pews out. What? We just got the pews in. He said, well, if we're worried about scratching the pews, more worried about the pews than we are the people, then let's get the pews out and the people will sit on the floor. So his focus was on the heart of the people. Amen. So we get past, thank you, we get past what people look like, our preconceived notions of who they are and what they think. I'm horrible at that. I am horrible at that. I want to share a story. I don't think Scott will mind. We were coaching together at Granite Hills. And I'm the first time head coach. You know, I've never been a head coach before, so it's all got to be this way. So, I mean, everything, I even organized my medicine cabinet by size. <laughs> you know, everything goes down, and Becky goes, don't tell people that. <laughs> That's the way I'm made. Ordered straight. You know, the TV remotes, if you look at them, I didn't even notice it, but look in there, they're by size. Oh, you're, you're nuts. And I'm not even close to Darren. <laughs> Sorry. I forgot where I was at. Anyway. So, anyway, let's, let's move on. I'm off on a rabbit trail. Oh, no, Scott. So, so we're, we're, we're coaching. We're coaching. And I am in the bus. We just lose a game, and we haven't won a game in a year. And then the second year, we beat a team that was horrible. In fact, they were so bad, they accused us of running up the score. <laughs> and I think we scored twice. <laughs> and that was on an accident. So my coaching career is on the line, and I get in the bus, and I start screaming. Scott comes up to me. In fact, it's interesting being around him because he remembers all of his kids' names. Oh, I've ever played, played for him. They come up and he remember, oh yeah, you're so-and-so. They look familiar to me, but I'm like, I don't know. You, you, know, you gained 70 pounds, you got a beard, and you're wearing a false nose and sunglasses. I'm not sure who you are. <laughs> but he comes up to me and he says, what happened to the guy that coached with me in Lindsay? I said, what do you mean? The guy that really cared about kids, that had a relationship, that talked to kids. And you know how I told you we get wake-up calls? It's like, man, that was a wake-up call. 
That was a wake-up call. My focus was on this way and not this way or that way. Now, I tried to change. I would like to tell you that once I changed, we won the rest of our games. <laughs> but we didn't. We didn't. But the fact was that the focus was wrong and we need to be woken up. And God is faithful to bring someone into your life. A Shimei, a Bowser, someone who is willing to tell you the truth in love, ask you questions that are, make you search, that you have to go before the Lord and say, okay, is this true? If it's true, I want to change. And you have to have a heart willing to change. The man who will not receive instruction will be broken. You must, that's Mr. and Mrs. Man, you must be willing to be instructed. And God's word is our instruction. So how are disciples made? He says that we're to go preach the truth. So is preaching, does preaching change anybody? We're studying in the morning, we're studying uh, shepherding a child's heart. And we're learning that it's not about behavior modification. It's not about what you can make someone do because you have the power or even because you have the right. But it's making a change that the individual that you're looking at, you're creating a change in a heart that focuses no longer on self, but focuses on the Lord. And so when we teach, when we go to make disciples, as Ryan has been teaching us week after week, you've got to spend time with people. It's not just Sunday for 45 minutes. It's spending time. It's taking time as with your grandson or your granddaughter walking with them, talking with them, sharing the word, more than just with your own kin, but with those that are maybe even the untouchables, the willingness to go, to make disciples of all people, no one excluded. And then there's teaching, but what is more important and what do people see more than what they hear? Or excuse me, what do they, they hear a lot, but what is it that they normally respond to? What they see. So our making disciples is people seeing us live in, within the authority that God has given to us. And I'm, I'm running out of time here, so we're gonna, we are going to have to close this up pretty quick here. So disciples are made. Romans chapter 10, beginning in verse 14, says, Paul is writing, great apostle Paul, with a heart of evangelism and a heart of for all people. A heart that when he's stoned and left for dead, moves the rocks off him, dusts himself off and says, boys, let's go back in town. And if I'm one of the boys, I'm going, whoa, time out, boss. They just tried to kill you. In fact, we thought you were dead. We were mourning. And now you want to go back into town again? This is what God has called us to do. The great apostle Paul writes, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? So if you and I don't speak up, how are they going to know? If we don't shine like the light on a hill, how are they going to see where to go? How will they believe in him in whom they've not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? We've been sent. Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. You and I carry with the authority of God the good news of good things. We have a message for a world that's going to hell in a handbasket, racing there, and time is closing. It's so short that it's not like we say, well, we got time because you don't know how long you're going to live, and you don't know how long it is before the Lord returns because there's not much left to be done before he does come. Time is short. It's time to go. So how we live our life is going to be a, a standard that other people are going to look at, and they're going to see. And I'm going to close here real quick, so please bear with me. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, Peter writes, Beloved, I beseech you as aliens and exiles to abstain from passions of the flesh that wage war against your soul. Talking to Christians... 
things wage war in our soul. Each one of us has something in peculiar that the devil knows how to get you. I don't know what it is. I don't want to know what it is. But I know that there's things that I have no trouble with and there's things that I struggle with every day, every moment. And I praise God that he's given me the power over it. But it takes turning away. It means I turn away from it. So, beloved, I beseech you as aliens and exiles, abstain from passions of the flesh that wage war against your soul. Maintain good conduct among the Gentiles, or the unsaved in our case, so that in case they speak against you as wrongdoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God in the day of visitation. So it's important that we are living our testimony because we are constantly being watched. Remember, we're the city on a hill. We're the, we are the light of the world. There was a command to baptize or be baptized. So we are to go and to baptize and to be baptized ourselves. And what is baptism? It's an outward expression of the inward thing that's taken place in your life, right? It's a testimony to the world that you now are saying, I've been cleansed and I am different. No longer the way I was before. There are people that live in our community that knew me when I was in high school. And if you meet them and they're not saved, they won't understand if you know, yeah, you know Bob Ruckman? Oh, yeah, man. Remember when he was in high school and they start going through the whole litany of all the wonderful things that I did when I was in high school. <laughs> aren't you glad that now as an adult, those of you that are adults, aren't judged by what you did in high school? You wouldn't let me up here. I'm surprised my wife married me. She didn't know any better. Here's the thing. There is no place in your teaching, there is no place when you were given authority, there is no place where you are to expound your opinions, expound your ideas, expound what you think. What you are to teach is the good news and that only comes from the Word of God. So if it ain't the Word, it ain't the Word. If you're not telling people the word of God, you're not telling them anything they don't already know. You and I are responsible and be given the authority not to preach our own thoughts, but to preach the word of God. To tell people the truth in love. Just like what happened on Tuesday night. There were people touched by the word. Why do you think that guy stood up and was mad? Do he really think? And, and do, do I think that anything's going to happen? I don't know. That's up to God. It's not up to me. But he was mad at Christians. He was mad at the truth because the truth exposes the lie. And when you and I have the authority to expose the lie, we do that. And we do it because we've been given that authority. Therefore, as a result of Christ having all authority, in heaven and on earth, you go, you teach, you baptize, you preach, you make disciples. There's nobody left to do it. The apostles are all dead, so it's up to you and me. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, 14 through 17, Paul writes, Remind them of these things and solemnly charge them in the presence of God not to wrangle about words which are useless and lead to ruin of hearers. Be diligent to present yourself to prove to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling or dividing the word of truth. But avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness, and this talk will spread like gangrene. Things that aren't of God will kill you and kill those that you're sharing with. He said, it's the word and nothing but the word, so help me, it's the word. The message of the church today is weak because the church is asleep in the light. Now that's, that's, that's what I see. That may not be what you see. 
But I think we got a real clear wake-up call, at least from one person, from a Shimei. They said, where was the church? Well, I ask the same thing. Can you imagine, and please don't take this wrong, imagine a pastor standing up and saying, I need five people. <laughs> I need five people. There's 50 here. I need five. Scary. I know we all are busy. We all have things. God's got to convict you if indeed there is conviction in this. Perhaps it's just me. Maybe it's just me. I'm sharing with you, and this is the point I want to close with. Jesus said, watch this now, I am the light of the world. Apart from me, there is no light. If you read in the Gospel of John, the light became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus told his disciples, he said, I'm leaving, and when I go, the light goes with me. But fear not, all authority has been given to me, so that now you and I, beginning with the disciples, are now the new light, and we are the light. Listen to this. Uh, Matthew chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount, verses 12 through 15. You are the salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth. Jesus said, I am the light. I am the bread of life. When I go, the light goes. So what's left to light the world? What is left if Jesus is gone? Where is the light if it's not you and me? We talk about a rapture. Maybe you don't talk about the rapture, but I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture that God is coming. Jesus is coming in the air to take his church. What happens when all the good and the light is taken away from the earth, from the world? In an instant, in the moment, in the flashing of an eye, in the sound of a trumpet, the dead in Christ shall rise. And then we who are over our lives shall be united together with him in the air. Where's the light when all that happens? The light just went out, baby. It's gone. And what happens immediately following that? Don't we have Ezekiel's war? You taught on that. Some would differ. But we have an invasion of Israel. We have an overthrow. We have... We have Chaos. So being light and being salt means that we're here to, for a purpose, to change things. I'm here for a purpose to change things. I want to do that. I don't want to rust out. I don't know how many years I have left in life or how many minutes I have left in life. As a wonderful aged lady told me one day, son, we're not guaranteed another minute. And so I think she was like 97 or something. I'm, I'm kidding. I, I don't know how old she was. But I remember distinctly, she would put both hands on the side of my, of my car, and she's about this tall to the window. She looks up and she says, son, we're not guaranteed another minute. You're, you're right. You're right. We're not. What are you going to do with the minute you have left? That's my question. What are you going to do with the minute you got left, with the seconds you have left? You're going to study to show yourself approved so that you can share with the authority that God has given to you. Therefore, you're going into all the world and you are going to share the gospel. And you're going to get the Porterville recorder and find out what's going on in your community. And you're going to go the way Mike McIntosh and others have gone to find out what needs to be done. You're going to go to the police. You're going to go to the fire department. You're going to go to the ambulance services. You're going to go to the teachers. You're going to go to the principals. You're going to find out what they need. And if it's nothing more than praying, nothing more than praying, if it's simply praying. If you don't know where to go, you're not sure what to do, you do have a command to go. So do you think, as Ryan has said on numerous occasions, 
Do you think that when you make a simple prayer, Lord, show me where to go, he's going to tell you no? He already told you to go. I don't know where. Where do you want me to go? I'll show you. Pray for an opportunity to share Christ with somebody and you'll get it. You may not like it. it may be in line with everybody watching at the grocery store. But if you pray that prayer, you're going to get it. And if he gives you that, he's given you the authority to do it. And he's given you, as you have studied God's word and prayed, you're prepared to do it. We don't lack anything to do what he's called us to do. So with that, we'll close. There's so much more. I'm looking forward to another time of being able to finish and share with you the balance of this where we talk about salt and light and what that does. Remember that you are the only light left. There is no other light. It's you. It's me. And if we put a lampshade over our light or we try to hide ourselves like the city on a hill, it's not going to happen. We are not doing what we have been commissioned to do. We're supposed to go. And that means we need to get it done. Father, thank you for the truth of your word. Lord, I pray that it is your word and not what I think. I pray, Lord, as you have, as you've convicted my heart, Lord, I pray that you would give me the strength now to follow through and not just get tired and frustrated. But Lord, that you would give us that will and desire and hunger to do what you've asked us to do. And know, Lord, that you've equipped us to do it. That we would study and know and not be worried and just go forth as you command us. We pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.